Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen, amen. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has called you into his house to hear his good news for you. We continue in our sermon series, the questions that need to be answered. And today's question is in line with the Old Testament reading and the gospel reading for today, a very tough one to preach on. But the topic and the question that needs to be answered is, what does God say about marriage? Back in September 12th, it was announced that the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America consecrated a woman who believes she's a man to be a bishop in the western part of the state. Bishop Megan Rohrer believes she is a man, and she is married to a woman, and she recognized by the state of California, and she has two children. We call for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America to repent of this egregious sin, and we repent ourselves as a nation that wants to feed the lies that people tell themselves. Today we will focus on the fact that marriage is defined by God, not by us. The humanity of this world is broken. God defines what is right and pure. Welcome all of you to worship. Uh, if you haven't heard it, um, the Lord has humbled this servant with a case of shingles. I've been all worried about COVID, and here I am with a, a thing. And no, I have not been asked about a shingle shock. I'm 59, uh, shot. I'm 59 years old, and I guess I was too young. But now I heard on the advertisement last night, I could have had it when I was at 55 getting the shot. What am I to do? Uh, as I told our, our brother Greg Easton, the Lord has wonderful ways of humbling the vein. And so because of this, I thought I could just stay away from those who haven't had chicken pox or the obvious, but by doctor's orders, I'm to stay away from all of you. So the way of service today is going to be, I'm going to keep on this side. Chris, you're going to stay safe on that side. I'm not going to greet you as we leave. I will not be serving you here with the Holy Supper. Uh, Hunter Jensen and Carol Cardle will be serving you. I'll bless you as you leave. We will do our normal way of, of receiving by table. I just want to keep you safe. I don't want you to, and if you've had shingles, you understand. Maybe you've had a light case of it. Um, I'm suffering here with a, a head that just doesn't want to quit throbbing. So I will do my best for you for the sake of Christ. I ask that you would hold me in your prayers. Also in our prayers for today, we're going to lift uh, Molly and Jamie, Gwen, Sandy, Roger, and Anne couple of items that need your attention. It just seems so hard to think about this here in the beginning of October, our first Sunday of October, but you have shoe boxes back there in the narthex that need to be filled. It's just, I want to get through fall, but we have to do this. So take a shoe box. We have 100 boxes. Wouldn't that be great to fill all of those? And um, so fill them up. Follow the instructions and the dates there. It comes quickly. Another thing that's going to come quickly is we've been invited to participate in the live nativity that's going to be this church, St. John and uh, St. Paul. People are going to drive through. Our role is going to be about Old Testament. Got to have the Old Testament in order to understand what that nativity is all about. So from Adam and Eve to the prophets, we'll have uh, uh, people will be seeing some things. We'll have some candy canes to hand out. This can only be done with volunteers. So prayfully consider this. There's details in the back. Um, this is, a, I think, a fun event, and I've already looked at the forecast that early December is supposed to be a little mild, so Lord willing, that would be the case. And then finally, please pay note to other items in the bulletin, as uh, there are some important announcements, one pertaining to Bethel Bible Study. If you are contemplating about that, we need you to sign up today. We need 20 members to uh, participate in this to make sure it's a worthwhile uh, study. Are there any other announcements that need to be said? Then I invite you to stand and let us open our worship with hymn 97.
Please turn to page 77 for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a moment of silent confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority alone, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our service continues on page 78. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help save, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Our hymn of praise is on page 81. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia.
be with you. Please return to your bulletin, and there in the middle of page one is our prayer of the day. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Graciously pardon and give peace to your faithful people, O Lord, that being cleansed from every sin, we may be free and glad to serve. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. Let us hear from God reading God's word today as Chris knew. Good morning. Good morning. The Old Testament lesson, which is our first lesson of the day, is going to be a familiar one to you. Here we learn the why and the how God has created man and woman. The reading is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the God Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. And because she was taken out of man, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Here ends the lesson. Let us read responsively the psalm for today. It is Psalm 128. I will read the odd verses, if you then will read the bold, even verses. Psalm 128. Happy are they who fear the Lord and who follow in his ways. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive shoots around about your table. The Lord bless you from Zion, and may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. The second reading today is written in Hebrews, chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, and then 14 through 18. Paul is writing to the Hebrews, Hebrews who are knowledgeable and who have a history with the Old Testament. And here Paul is trying to make the point about how they should now reflect upon Jesus as to what a great salvation he has brought to all of us through his birth, his suffering, his death. Hebrews 2, 1 through 13. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable, 
and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will, for it was not to the angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you have or that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him. You made him for a while little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned and with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect, through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those through, who through fear of death are subject to lifelong slavery, for surely it is, it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are not being tempted. Here ends the reading. Let us stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning at the second verse. The Pharisees came up in order to test Jesus, asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce to send him away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them, male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. 
But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Dear children, as much as I want to hold you in my hands and bless you, I must refrain from having you come up forward. I do have candy in the back, so please take that, and we'll get a children's sermon next Sunday, Lord willing. So let us turn to hymn 198, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silent. Before I begin, I just failed to announce, um, because of my current affliction, um, I will not be participating in any programming this week, Um, so um, all the stuff that I'm supposed to be doing, I am going to cancel until next week, Sunday, so women's Bible study, men's Bible study, also Saturday's events, you certainly can have them, I just won't be participating, so that's up to you, please let me know. I will be in contact with you through phone calls if you need to be. Well, let us begin. The old expression goes, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. But alas, I think this gives 
too much credit to sinful humanity. The inerrant word of God says, according to Ecclesiastes, what has been done is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after In other words, no matter how hard we try, humanity in its sin will repeat sin over and over again and act as if this is a new thing, a fresh approach on things. The only cure is the gospel, not our will. Today's gospel provides an opportunity to ask the difficult question that plagues humanity since the fall as there is nothing new under the sun. Today's question that needs to be answered, what does God say about marriage? Or maybe the question should be said, who has the last word concerning marriage? We may think that the discussion of the nature of marriage is something new, something novel in our time, but in today's gospel demonstrates that there was a controversy over marriage clear back to the first century, and we know even earlier than that. In this case, the Pharisees came to Jesus with a question about divorce. This really wasn't something they wanted to know. They just really wanted to corner the man. Jesus responded with an answer that not only speaks to divorce, but also gives a definition of marriage that speaks to the controversies concerning marriage in our time. The Pharisees Pharisees did exactly what people do to this day when they want to test or disobey God's word, they take the passage and rip it out of its context. In this specific case, the Pharisees give the impression that they can throw their wives out by simply publishing a certificate of divorce. The context of the passage shows that the husband must show his wife that she is guilty of some indecency before he can dismiss her. In other words, she must be guilty of sin against the marriage. That speaks for the man, too, by the way. Jesus elaborated further on the cause of this guideline concerning divorce. Then he referred to the creation of marriage that we ourselves heard as Chris read from the Old Testament reading. According to Mark, Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus was saying that because of the sinful nature that we have from birth, Husbands and wives will sin against each other. It is because of this sin that divorce happens. So divorce is already evil. The guidelines for divorce that Moses gave is not an excuse. It is not to justify people from the sin of divorce. They were guidelines so that the evil of divorce did not become something even worse. Then Jesus turns to the beginning where God created marriage before the fall into sin. Notice that Jesus quoted and affirmed the account of creation of marriage as Moses recorded in Genesis. This isn't some sort of mythology that people want to present today. In Genesis chapter 1 we read, So God created man in his own image, in his own image, and the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Then the more detailed review of creation specifically to humanity is on Genesis chapter 2. We read, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Please note, God's word is clear. Male and female. It also says man, not men. And wife, not wives. There's one male, one female, one man, one wife. 
According to Genesis' account, marriage is of one flesh union of this one male man and this one female wife. This is the Genesis account of creation of marriage that Jesus affirmed and upheld in the reading of today's gospel. These words state clearly about God's intent on a very, very intimate relationship. And from this Genesis account, Jesus taught the conclusion, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Note that Jesus said that it is, that it is two who become one flesh. Not three or more, but two. Note also that Jesus says that it is God who has made this union, therefore only God has the privilege to separate it. This means that if Adam and Eve had not sinned and died, they would still be alive because they would be immortal. They would still be marriage, married today. It's hard for us to understand. From this reading and the parallel readings in the gospel, it is very clear that Jesus teaches it is one flesh, union of one and only man, and one and only one female. There is no male, male. There is no female, female. There is no polygamy. There is no polyamory. That's married to two people at one time or more. Or any other arrangements involving more than two people. Finally, this is a union that only God can terminate and therefore remains effect until death breaks the union. It is common to have people here before this altar, before this cross, man and woman, to say, until death us do part. People who say that Jesus had nothing to say and that the current marriage debate are committing blasphemy. And the fact that they get away with it demonstrates our culture's breathtaking biblical ignorance or a staggering arrogance that states the Holy Spirit is doing something new. Jesus' teachings concerning marriage presents us with some real challenges in our day. Most of us know and perhaps personally experience the painful results of divorce. Most of us know people who have had multiple sexual partners. Most of us know people who cohabitate most of us know people who are dealing with same-sex attraction. And when we remember that Jesus taught and said, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart, we must realize that no one can live up to the marriage standard that Jesus presents. And Jesus is God in the flesh. And Jesus has the last word. So once again, we find ourselves in Romans chapter 3, and we must agree, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And for the record, all means all. Either sins of commission or sins of omission, we have willfully permitted these egregious sins against God and marriage. So where can we go where can we go to find relief from the condemnation that, of this impossible standard? The fact of the matter is there is nothing we can do. Once again, we see that we stand before God condemned. However, if you've shut down already, please open your ears. However, although there is nothing we can do, there is something that God has already done. The Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write that God chooses us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. We see the symbolism of this in the very way that God created Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, it's recorded this way. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall across the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into woman and brought her to the man. 
Can you imagine Adam's excitement when he saw Eve for the first time? God created a bride for Adam from the wound of his side. Here, although Adam and Eve had not yet sinned, God was already providing an image that pointed forward to the manner in which he would provide a bride for his only beloved son. John 19 records, after Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. The Son of God took on human flesh, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, Paul writes to the church. In this way, he earned forgiveness for all our sins, including the sins we have committed against the estate of marriage. No matter how we justify our sin, we are left with the undeniable fact that it is God who defines marriage, not us. And we are forgiven by what Jesus has done, every one of us. But here's the kicker. God help us. That even as we acknowledge this, in the sin of our self-righteousness, we jump across the road and plunge hedge first into the other ditch. Among the many errors that have slipped into the marriage debate is that the Bible, we believe, somehow, some way condemns this sin against marriage. So that often people will struggle with sins related to marriage, have come to believe that the Bible, or at least the church, considers this sin to be the greatest damnable sin ever. It's unforgivable. The Bible doesn't say that. This is the tragic in our self-righteous arrogance. We have denied the gospel from so many who need to hear the balm of healing. For the forgiveness of Jesus Christ is earned with his suffering and death on the cross for all. The church is for people like me, like you, who struggle with our sins and repent of them and look to Jesus on the cross for the only source of forgiveness. The church is not for people who are without sin, for the Bible is clear. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sound familiar? Christ Jesus has risen from the dead and has ascended into heaven in order to prepare a place for His bride, His lovely church. And on the last day, he will return and raise all the dead in both body and soul. Those who believe in him will join him in the place he has prepared. Among the people who will be there will be like people like you and me who have sinned against marriage and yet have received the forgiveness that Jesus earned for us and them on the cross. It's a crazy list of people. People like King David, who had an affair with a wife of his most loyal soldier in his army. People like David's brother Judah, who had an affair with his deceased son's wife, Tamar, as she posed to be a prostitute. People like Samson. People like Samson, who had a messy affair with Delilah. People like King Solomon and the patriarchs, Abraham and Jacob, who had multiple wives. People like St. Augustine, who lived on the wild side until the Holy Spirit brought him into the family of God and has made one of the fathers of the Western church in whose shoulders we stand on today. 
The history of the church is full of people who have sinned against marriage and received the forgiveness that Jesus has earned for them. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. He came also to redeem those who sinned against marriage. And if anything you would walk away for today is this. By coming forward and by receiving your Jesus in body and blood, in with under the bread and wine, you have this assurance that all your sins, all your sins are forgiven. And he has paid for them. And you are redeemed. And you are loved as a child of God. Now and forever. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all our understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now and forever. Amen. I invite you to stand and confess your holy faith. Today we're going to use the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God and for all people according to their needs. With each petition, I will end with, Lord, in your mercy, I ask that you would respond with, hear our prayer. For the Spirit's help, O Lord, to receive the kingdom of God in humble repentance like little children, that we may enter in the joy of his forgiveness in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayer. For the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that we may pay closer attention to God's word lest we drift away from it and neglect the great salvation it reveals to us in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the engaged, the newly married, and those who have shared many years together, that the Lord who joins man and woman together in a reflection of his eternal love, so that they no longer are two but one flesh, would bless them with every more, even more of his love, to live together in it with joy their whole lives long. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all parents who have brought their children to Christ and the waters of holy baptism, that they would continue to bring them to Christ in faithful service, to the divine service, and to Sunday school, so that he may continue to take them in his arms and bless them through his word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the eyes of faith that we do not see everything subject to Jesus, yet we would see him crowned with glory and honor at your right hand, so believe that nothing is outside of his control. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Jamie, for Anne, for Sandy, for Molly, for Gwen, for Roger, and all others who suffer in body and mind, that they would take comfort that God has made the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And so in all their trials, they may put their trust in him. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For all who eat and drink Christ's body and blood today, that the Lord would deepen us in the truth that Christ has made us bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. So not doubt, but believe that he will hold fast to us forever. Lord, in your, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your hands, O Lord, we commend all whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. 
and share the peace as you are comfortable. We'll sing, creating me a clean heart, O God, as the offering is brought forward. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. And through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our service continues on page, seven, page 88. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in the remembrance of me. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Holy things for holy people. Our Lord invites you to come and receive him. Please be seated.
Congregation, please stand. Let us sing the post-communion canticle found on page uh, 92. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Forgiven people of God, our closing hymn is hymn 262, On Our Way Rejoicing. have any programming that involves me unless uh, someone would volunteer. No confirmation, no 7th, 8th grade, ninth grade confirmation. We're just going to have to jump over this week. Go in peace and serve the Lord. We will. Thanks be to God. That was the most difficult thing I've ever done.